good morning to all hope you are sound and safe uh, last day we have dealt with the first two sections of the wasteland written by T.S. Eliot and today we will be discussing the remaining three sections and uh, let's get into the text the third section of the wasteland is titled the fire sermon the title is taken from lord buddha's sermon at gaya where he addressed thousands of monks who were the followers of mahakashyapa uh, the chief of uruvela jatila a group of people who were the fire worshippers kassapa or otherwise known as mahakashyapa was the second uh, Buddha Guru, after Buddha uh, passed away, he was a renowned and well revered scholar said, who became envy at the enlightened one or the Buddha. Later, charmed by the wisdom of Buddha, he decided to follow the path of Buddha and his people along with him joined in his decision. They gathered on the hill of uh, Gaya, known as Gaya Sisa or Brahmayoni Hill, and listened to the words of uh, Buddha. Since they were fire worshippers, Buddha decided decides to use the symbol of fire, which indicates desire, and wanted to show them the path of path of liberation. Uh, this is the third discourse of Buddha, known as. Aditya Pariyaya Sutta or the Fire Sermon. Buddha admonishes his disciples against the fires of passion, desire, hatred, uh, uh, lust, and infatuation. The section also refers to the confess confessions of Saint Augustine. Uh, thus, by incorporating the two masters from the Orient and the Occident. Eliot wants the wastelanders or modern men to keep away from the snares of lust. But the question for shadows here is, can they do that? The original text of Buddha's fire sermon is given below, translated from Pali by uh, Nana Moli Thera. As I have already mentioned, you know, there were thousands of uh, Buddha, Buddha, Buddhist monks who gathered at Gaya and uh, Buddha uh, addresses the monks because all is burning and what is the all that is burning? He continues to give a description. The eye is burning, forms are burning, eye consciousness is burning, eye contact is burning, so and so. Burning with what? Burning with the fire of lust, the fire of hate, the fire of delusion. I say it is burning with birth aging and death with sorrows with lamentations with pains with griefs with despairs the ear the nose the tongue the sensory organs the perception itself the mind ideas etc etc so uh, his solution to get out of this uh, the fire the, this fire is uh, uh, enlightenment or finding the path of liberation uh, for that one should estrange himself from the sensual desire uh, he finds estrangements in the air he finds estrangement in the nose he finds estrangement in the mind so and so when he finds uh, estrangement passions fade out with the fading of passion he is liberated this is what buddha, buddha advised his disciples now during his utterance it is believed that the hearts of those who attended the function were liberated yes. from taints to clinging no more now we go to the analysis of this is the background uh, to the section and, and now we go to the analysis of the text the first few lines uh, the reverse tent is broken the last fingers of leaf clutch and sink into the wet bank. The wind crosses the brown land unheard. The nymphs are departed. Sweet Thames, 
run softly till I end my song. The river bears no empty bottles, sandwich papers, silk handkerchiefs, cardboard boxes, uh, cigarette ends, or other testimony of summer nights. The nymphs are departed, and their friends, the loitering hairs of city directors, departed, have left no addresses. By the waters of Lemon, I sat down and wept. Sweet Thames, run softly till I end my song. Sweet Thames, run softly, for I speak not loud or long. But at my back in a cold blast, I hear the rattle of bonds and chuckle spread from ear to ear. Here, the speaker indicates the uh, stagnated and polluted state of the river Thames, which was the symbol of purity and sanctity in the earlier ages, which in turn becomes the sign of a stagnated, contaminated, and decayed culture. Uh, in almost all the ancient cultures, the rivers are considered sanctimonious. Uh, think about India, especially in northern India, river Ganga is considered to be uh, of utmost uh, uh, sanctity. Uh, Sri Shankara addresses uh, Ganga as Purna Brahma Swarupe, which means the incarnation of the Supreme Being, God Himself. Ganga is considered to be uh, uh, the transformed form of the Supreme Being. Uh, likewise, for the Europeans, uh, especially for uh, English people, Thames was uh, a sacred river. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, uh, since uh, it is the modern times, it is a land of dryness and dead trees, where always the sun beats, the shade and shelter provided by the leafy boughs overhanging the river is broken because summer is over and the leaves have fallen. Uh, uh, you know, there are references to, uh, uh, you know, the Old Testament where the tent refers to a tabernacle. It's a wooden portable sanctuary constructed by Moses as a place of worship for the Israelites during the Exodus. Uh, it's also known as the tent of the congregation, uh, which is mentioned in Ishaya in the Old Testament. And the Lord commands to them, thou shall not broken my tent. The lines thus convey that something sacred is also broken or ir irrecoverably lost. Uh, here the speaker, I've given the, uh, the picture image of uh, the tabernacle, which is also known as the tent here. Now the speaker I mean Tiresias compares the present condition of Thames with its past by walking Spencer's Prothalamian, in which the poet celebrates the dual marriage of the daughters of Earl of Wooster. On the wedding day morning, the poet sees nymphs who gather, who gather flowers for the wedding. Eliot strategically uses the word nymphs to signify the nymphs from the past, that means Spencer's nymphs, and the nymphs of the present, that means modern city girls deserted by heirs of city directors. The speaker ironically states that the nymphs, the spirit of the river, and the city girls as well are departed. Spencer's idyllic world no longer exists and the ideals and joys of marriage are replaced by uncontrollable sensual passion. To indicate the intensity and tension of the situation, the speaker either Tiresias or the poet himself assumes the persona of the Samist of the modern age and laments. Uh, it is an echo of uh, Sam's from the Old Testament in which the Israelites lament during their exile in Babylon when uh, the rivers of Babylon brought back the memories of river Zion and an insatiable longing for their lost homeland. It evokes the speaker's feeling of despair and his yearning for another world, since the world he lives um, in, that means the wasteland or the modern world, is 
completely disintegrated and he's quite alienated from it. Uh, here the uh, phrase, uh, the word lemon can also refer to a lady or a mistress who is loved illicitly, hence foreshadowing the overall uh, theme of the section. Uh, Lac Lemon is the French name for Lake Geneva in Switzerland. During the composition of uh, the major portion of the poem, Eliot was in Lucerne, a nearby town to the lake, recovering from a mental breakdown. Thus, the poet of the wasteland is contrasted with the poet of the past, means Spencer, whereby the contaminated atmosphere of the present is satirized and problematized. Spencer's Thames was blessed with a divine scenic beauty by the presence of the nymphs, swans, wedding celebrations, uh, beautiful wildflowers and music scores. These are replaced in the present time by empty bottles, cigarette ends, silk handkerchiefs, uh, uh, cardboard boxes, etc. Other testimony of summer nights may mean the contraceptives used by the city girls and rich lads. In a nutshell, poet attempts to say that the modern world is engulfed by the fires of lust. The lyrical beauty of Spencer's refrain is contradicted by the sardonic imageries of old blast, rattling of bones, chuckling, etc., which are an ironic violation of Andrew Marwell's to his coy mistress. We already saw the poet describes the modern world as a war-affected rat's ally. Now he continues to describe the, model, uh, the movement of the rat on the banks of Thames, which is almost turned into a dull canal due to stagnation caused by pollution. A rat crept softly through the vegetation, dragging its slimy belly on the bank while I was fishing in the dull canal on a winter evening round behind the gas house, musing upon the king, my brother's rack, and on the king, my father's death before him. White body is naked on the low dumb ground that once cast in a little low dry garret rattled by the rat's foot only year to year. But at my back, from time to time I hear the sounds of horns and mottoes which shall bring Sweeney to Miss Potter in the spring. Oh, the moon shone bright on Mrs. Potter and on her daughter. They wash their feet in soda water. Et osus vos then fans shantan dan la cupo. Here, rat may be the symbol of the harbinger of evil since it rattles on the bones of dead men. It may also symbolize war which moves in unexpected directions. The visceral vocabulary, like slimy belly, suggests that as the rat creeps, the war slowly infiltrates the world. Even though the rat leaves the scene, it may leave uh, some sort of residue behind. Likewise, even after the war, even after the treaties is signed, the aftermath of the war still hovers all over uh, Europe. In both ways, the presence of the rats uh, designates decay, death and disintegration. Then the poetic persona ironically transforms into the mythical Fisher King and then assumes the persona of Ferdinand of The Tempest by William Shakespeare, who was musing upon his father's and brother's deaths. The speaker, as we can see, is obsessed with the imageries of death. The Bank of Thames, once covered by the beauty and fragrance of wildflowers, now deteriorated into a rat-infested dull canal where the breeze would bring the rotten smell of death. The shore is full of naked white bodies, which may be the dead bodies of the soldiers or those persons who committed suicide in the river. 
this alludes to the father and the brother of Ferdinand, Ophelia of Hamlet, King Ludwig from the first section, the drowned Phoenician sailor of uh, the Madame Sosostris episode, which we already discussed. The modern man's mad pursuit after the sensual pleasure is represented by a reference to Andrew Marvell's To His Coy Mistress, one of the best Carpedium songs in English literature. Here, he introduces Sweeney, uh, a character, a stereotype character uh, who appears in uh, several of Eliot's poems like Sweeney Erects, Sweeney Among the Nightingales, etc., who is an epitome of the sensual man. The honking motor cars refers to the Parliament of Beasts by John Day, in which the story of Actium is mentioned. According to the legend, Actium was a hunter uh, who accidentally peeps on goddess Diana, who is the goddess of chastity, while she was bathing naked in a river. Diana, in her wrath, turns Actium into a stag, and he was eventually torn into pieces by his own uh, hounds. Mrs. Potter is a prostitute in a notorious vulgar ballad sung by the Australian military troops of the First World War uh, and according to this ballad uh, she runs a brothel uh, in Cairo. The soda water mentioned here is not the uh, uh, you know uh, soda water which we drink but a solution of the bicarbonate of soda used to, to prevent venereal diseases uh, like syphilis, etc. In bowdier versions of the ballad, the feet are euphemism to genital organs. Suddenly, this mad pursuit of the modern world is contrasted uh, uh, to the triumph of Parsifal, a grail knight. Here, Elliot refers to the sonnet Parsifal, which was added to uh, Richard Wagner's opera Parsifal, uh, published in 1882 by the French poet Paul Verlaine. The line can be translated as, and all those children's voices sing in the dome. The line, et oises voices and fan then shan, then la couple. That line can be translated as, and all those children's voices sing in the dome. Uh, the story of Parsifal is as follows. King Amphotas is the leader of the Grey Knights and uh, keeper of the Grey The cup that Christ used at the Last Supper and also that caught his blood at the crucifixion. He was shamefully injured by a woman namely Kandrai in, an, in his sexual misstep towards her and then lost his own spear, the sacred relic that pierced uh, Christ's body. Amphotas has learned in a vision that the only hope he has of being healed of his wound will come in the form of an innocent fool who is enlightened through compassion. Parsifal, the runaway son of a dead knight, is the innocent fool. He resists seduction uh, in the magician's garden, recovers the stolen spear and arrives at the Grail Castle on Good Friday, the day of Amphot, Amphotas' father's funeral. The closing climat uh, uh, climactic scene of the opera, the dead father in his coffin and the wounded king on his litter are brought into the hall. The knights urge Amphotas to uncover the Grail, but he resists because he wants to die and uh, he knows he won't uh, uh, he won't if the grail is there. Parsifal heals Amphotas wound by touching it with the holy spear. The young knight then uncovers the grail which illuminates the whole uh, hall. We hear the voices of boys singing from the dome, miracle of supreme salvation or redeemer redeemed. Berlin Sonnet describes this closing moment of the opera. Parsifal has resisted the blandishments of various women 
He has retrieved the Holy Spear, hailed the king, and participated in the Grail Communion ceremony, the sonnet, this all these events as past accomplishment. Before uh, it heals the king, Ossifel's feet are washed by the temptress country with water from Holy Spring. This ceremonial washing of feet is parodied in the preceding lines on Mrs. Potter. Thus the poet indicates that the people in the wasteland cannot control their sensual pursuit. Everywhere either Sweeney's are found or victims like uh, Philomel. Like a beautiful opera uh, converse, uh, conversation, he juxtaposes this point with the sounds of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, there is a, a spelling mistake. Like a beautiful opera composition, he juxtaposes this point with the sound of a swallow, uh, a nightingale, and Hupi reminiscing of the story of Philomel. Then we have the lines, tweet, 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 jug, 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 so rudely forced, tear you. Uh, it should be red like, it should be red like, chuk, 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 chuk. so rudely forced. As if we listen to the songs of the sounds of birds. Now, uh, uh, the text Unreal City, under the brown fog of a winter noon, Mr. Eugenides, the Smyrna merchant, unshaven with a pocket full of currents, PIF London documents at sight, asked me in demotic French uh, to uh, luncheon at the Cannon Street Hotel followed by a weekend at the Metropole. The Unreal City episode appears again. Smyrna is modern Izmir in Western Turkey, a, a, a great trading port of Asia Minor and also one of the seven Christian churches in Asia mentioned in the New Testament. Mr. Eugenides can be the one-eyed merchant of the Tarot Pack and also associated with the vegetation deity Attis. Eliot himself acknowledged that, in fact, he had such a conversation with an unshaven minor merchant. Uh, the line CAF, London documents at sight, is CAF is the short form of cost, insurance, and freight. Documents at sight implies the documents of ownership and transport which are to be handed to the purchaser in exchange for a bank draft payable on site. Demotic French means the vulgar French. A weekend at Metropole is understood as an invitation to a casual covert sex. Here, Elliot gives us the clue of homosexuality, which is considered to be unproductive by the use value oriented European system. Uh, he also alludes to the, the scandal mongering lady's question What are you getting married for if you don't want children? Uh, now we have the text again at the Violet Tower. Uh, when the eyes and back turn upward from the dusk, when the human engine waits, uh, like a taxi throbbing waiting, and it goes on uh, mm. to describe the episode of the young man carbon killer and the typist. Please go through the text. Now let's analyze this episode. Uh, the opening line of the episode, opening lines of the episode are a reference to Sappho, the Greek poetess of 7th century BC. In fragment number 149, there is a prayer addressed to the evening star to bring back the, the child to his mother. There is also a connection to R. L. Stevenson's poem, The Requiem in which these lines uh, home is the sailor home from sea and the hunter home from the uh, the hill are there some critics are of the opinion that the lines echo the opening of the canto eighth of purgatorio of dante all these are contrasted to the uh, 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 fast-paced mechanized life of modern man here, humans are compared to an engine, a taxi waiting and throbbing, 
uh, which implies the highly routinized modern lie. It is in this episode that for the first time, uh, Tiresias uh, is introduced. He watches and foretells the events or the sensual encounters that take place uh, in the life of a young unnamed lady typist. After she is back from her busy office life, she is having an illicit affair with a house agent's clerk who is referred as the young man carbon killer. She is not actually interested in him since she is bored and tired due to her hectic work schedule. But he is quite unmindful uh, of this and uh, his pompous and, and, and he prompts her to have sex which invites her contempt. After he leaves, she looks at herself in the mirror and automatically puts a record in the gram font. This activity is ironically contrasted to an allusion to Oliver Goldsmith's Vicar of the Wakefield in which the heroine Olivia sings a song after she was seduced by a person called Squire Thornhill. The song is not meant to be taken seriously, hence the ironic contrast between Olivia and the typist is erased or rather obliterated. Eliot here continues his attack on the sentimental style of 18th century. The scene is now shifted to uh, the songs of the daughters of the river Thames modeled on Wagner's The Ring of Nye Blanks. Uh, see, there is a beautiful technique incorporated here. The song which we are going to analyze can be taken as the song uh, on the record uh, uh, of uh, which we can hear from the grain form put by a lady typist. One more reference is there, the Bradford Millionaire. Bradford, Million Bradford is a place which shot into prominence during the First World War which is very famous for uh, the trade of uh, woolen cloths. Now we analyze the song of uh, the songs of the daughters of uh, Thames. The song of the first daughter. The river sweats oil and tar, the barges drift with the turning tide, red sails wide to leeward, swing on the heavy spar, the barges wash, drifting logs, down Greenwich Reach, past the Isle of Dogs, wee la la la, la 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 la. The contaminated state of the river due to industrialization is emphasized here. The river is so filled with oil and tar, and the Thames appears to sweat the stuff. The second song, Eliot reminds us of the parade of Queen Elizabeth to Thames in 1572 with Sir Robert Dudley, uh, Earl of Leicester, and uh, which is mentioned by a person called Anthony Frau in a letter he sent to King Philip of Spain. According to Frau, throughout the journey, uh, both Elizabeth and Leicester were flirting while passing through different regions in Thames and they were quite unmindful of their journey. The peal of bells and white towers, though rougher to churches, may also have sexual connotation. Now the second song, Elizabeth and Leicester beating oars, the stern was formed, a gilded shell, red and gold, the brisk swell, rippled with sh rippled both shores, southwest wind, carried downstream, the peal of bell, white towers, wee la la la, la 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 la, which we already discussed. In the final song, Eliot juxtaposes the story of the modern city girl mm -hmm. who is from Highbury and lost her chastity at Q, Richmond and Q uh, in a narrow canoe. Thereafter, she continues to have several illicit relationships with several men. Uh, the text goes like this Trams and dusty trees, Highbury bore me, Richmond and Q undid me. 
Highbury bore me. The, the lines Highbury bore me, Richmond and Q undid me are reminiscent of the lines uh, in Purgatorio uh, of Dante, in which he mentions the story of a girl called Lapia. Uh, Lapia says, uh, Siena made me, Marema undid me. Uh, the uh, the line lines continue by Richmond. I raised my knees supine on the floor of a narrow canoe. My feet are at Moorgate, and my heart under my feet. After the event, he wept. He promised a new start. I made no comment. What should I resent? On Margate sense, I can connect nothing with nothing. The walk of broken fingernails of dirty hands. My people, humble people who expect nothing. La la. Uh, the journey of the modern city girl uh, 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 continues to have uh, uh, several illicit relationships. One of them even promises a new start, but she is disillusioned in such a degree that she cannot connect anything with anything else. The song abruptly ends with the syllables. La la, thus it signifies the broken state, uh, which were already been mentioned in the previous episodes, like that in the broken image, the heap of broken images, and broken tent, etc. The section ends with the promised sermon. Both Lord Buddha and St. Augustine are evoked. Buddha taught his disciples the ways to overcome desire, but in the wasteland, the preaching of the wise, the great masters, is just a repeating sound. Nobody could understand it. So, as the confessions of Saint Augustine, who was an absolute wreck during his prime, but by listening to the inner voice of the self, he mastered triumph over sensual pursuit. In the confessions, uh, Saint Augustine. Um, reveals uh, the kind of sins he committed in his past. First, he was a thief. Then he was he led a promiscuous life. He was an adulterer. Uh, he was an adulterer. Then uh, 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 so and so. Uh, by listening to the inner voice of the self or the voice of God inside, he mastered triumph over sensual pursuit. But in the wasteland, people no more have the ability to restrain themselves. The mad pursuit goes on and goes on. Hence, the sermon is futile and also it ends abruptly. Remember, the fire sermon is the longest session in the wasteland. Now, we move on to the next section, Death by Water. Actually, it was a, a huge section brutally edited by uh, Ezra Pound to uh, a 10 line section. Let me read it. Flebus, the Phoenician, a fortnight dead, forgot the cry of girls and the deep sea swell and the profit and loss. A current under sea picked his bonds in whispers. As he rose and fell, he passed the stages of age and youth, entering the whirlpool. Gentile or Jew, O oh, you who turn the wheel and look to windward, consider Phlebas, who was once handsome and tall as you. Phlebas is the drawn Phoenician sailor of uh, uh, Madame Sosostris prediction which leads her to tell the narrator to fear death by water. He's a Phoenician uh, uh, which is actually modern day Syria. Uh, he's a Phoenician merchant and he's a he's, he's a fortnight dead and only after death that he forgets the profit and loss. That means during his lifetime he was always after profit and loss. The currents here are a homonym of the currents 
of Mr. Eugenides in the fire sermon, but this time the currents aren't uh, a hidden means of transport in his pocket, but the tumult of waves uh, that wash over his bonds, just as the rats did in the gutters. As he was about to die, entangled in a whirlpool, Phlebas sees his life before his eyes. But here there is no hope for rebirth or resurrection. Phlebas contemplation of the use of his life will not bring him second chances. It yet suggests that death is an inevitable universal phenomena that cannot be overcome by anyone, Gentile or Jew. See here Eliot, uh, Eliot's fantastic use of uh, the binaries can be seen, uh, Gentile or Jew, profit and loss, life and death, etc., which is uh, uh, which are just like the bobbing waves, the uh, uh, the coming and uh, the ebb and uh, 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 flow of the waves. Everyone will have to meet the lack of flavors unless the wheel, the wheel of fortune, we we, we turn will bring good luck. Every man looks windward hoping for the good tidings but whether luck or tidings are good or ill it all ends in death anyway so this section is considered to be a warning to the wastelanders who are always after uh, sensual pleasure now the fifth section and the last section of the wasteland namely what the thunder said let's go through the text after the torchlight red on sweaty faces after the frosty silence in the gardens after the agony in stony places the shouting and the crying prison and palace and the reverberation of thunder of spring over distant mountains he who was living is now dead we who are living are now dying with a little patience. See, there are three major episodes in this section. First one, the crucifixion of Christ, his eventual resurrection, and the journey to Emmaus made by uh, two of the disciples of Jesus Christ. The second one is the present decay of Eastern Europe. The third one, the hallucinatory vision upon the chapel perilous and the holy grail. Also keep in mind the instruction of Prajapati to his sons taken from the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad uh, 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 is also crucial to the central theme of the section. The opening lines refer to the betrayal and arrest of Jesus Christ in the garden of Gets, I mean, his eventual sufferings and uh, uh, his crucifixion and the events associated with it. At the time of crucifixion, uh, it, there was a cataclysmic earthquake, thunder and lightning. Now the text goes on. Uh, here is no water but only rock, rock and no water and the sandy uh, rod the rod winding above among the mountains which are mountains of rock without water it goes on like that and uh, uh, it offers a kind of hallucinatory vision while we walk through the desert we may feel that uh, at places we can find water but when we reach the there won't be uh, the trace of water if there were water and no rock, if there were rock and also water and water, a spring, a pool among the rock, uh, if there were the sound of water only, not the cicada, dry grass singing, but sound of water over a rock, where the hermit thrash sings in the pine trees, drip drop, drip drop, drip drop. Actually, the musical quality of the poem is revealed here in this drip drop. It can be uttered. Uh, like 
as if the water drips fall but there is no water these 29 lines of the water dripping song were the only good lines in the wasteland and the rest was ephemeral opines Eliot himself in a letter sent to Ford Maddox Ford Eliot believed that the less realistic literature is the more visual it must be dreams to be real and must be seen in these lines Eliot inserts beautiful visual images with sounds uh, which 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 creates a, a hypnotizing visionary effect this hallucinatory vision is maybe a mirage uh, that one experiences while traveling through a desert with a yearning to find water and shelter now to the text who is the third who walks always beside you when i count there are only you and i together but when i look ahead up the white road there is always another one walking beside you gliding wrapped in a brown mantle hooded i do not know whether a man or a woman but who is that one on the other side of you what is that sound high in the air murmur of maternal lamentation who are those hooded hordes swarming over endless plains stumbling in cracked earth ringed by the flat horizon only what is the city over the mountains cracks and reforms and bursts in the violet air falling towers jerusalem athens alexandria vienna london andrea the first passage is an oblique evocation of the journey of the disciples of Christ to Emmaus as mentioned in the Gospel of Luke. On the day of Christ's resurrection, two of the disciples, a different Gospels and different texts, say different names of these two disciples. So let's just take two of the disciples who are traveling on the road to Emmaus, a village near to Jerusalem. The resurrected Christ joins them and explains that everything happened in full accord with that divine plan and thereby clears their doubts. However, the disciples could not recognize him until he blesses uh, them on their supper and vanishes to the sky. Some critics are of the opinion that this episode also refers to the Ernest Shackleton's experiences. Ernest Shackleton was an explorer, especially to the uh, Arctic poles. His, his experiences during his Arctic expeditions, in which the explorers were haunted by the delusion that there was one more member in their team than could actually be counted. Elliot may be deliberately mystifying the reader by veiling the third figure thereby suggesting the inability to recognize god or the master or the xavier who can lead you to the right destination the wasteland or the modern world is completely degraded in such a way that spirituality could no more find fertility in the landscape as well as the mindscape of its inhabitants next passage i mean the passage starts with what is that that sound high in the air uh, this passage echoes with the horrifying aftermaths of the first world war as a result of which every city in europe was on the verge of collapse everywhere the march of military troops could be seen and the air is filled with the lamenting of uh, people as they had lost their beloved ones. Great cities of Europe, which were their cultural hubs in the past, begin to crack and gradually turn into the unreal city, which is mentioned in the first section. 
to substantiate this, Eliot refers to Hermann Hesse's A Glimpse into Chaos, published in 1920, in which Hesse writes, already half of Europe, at least half of Eastern Europe, on the way to chaos, I unquote. Hesse believed that due to the decay and exhaustion of European culture, there is a conflict between the higher faculties of human and his repressed primeval instincts. He yearned for a new type of man, as envisioned by Nietzsche in Thus Spake Zarathustra. A man, a, a new type of man, Asiatic, imaginative, powerful, spiritual, and defying bourgeois values. Eliot shares his postulation, but not his resolution. And, uh, and um, you know, uh, like Hesse, Eliot was also deeply distressed by the destitution in Central Europe after the First World War and also after uh, the Russian Revolution. Eliot's vision of the unreal cities may be a contrast to the ideal city imagined by uh, Plato and the city of God envisioned by Saint Augustine. Now, we have a passage uh, which offers a phantasmagoria of a hellish macabre, which is actually a reference to uh, the a, a painting of uh, the Dutch artist, 16th century Dutch artist, Hieronymus Bosch. Please go through the lines. Uh, a woman drew her, her long black hair out tight and fiddled whisper. Music on those strings and bats with baby faces in the violet light whistled and beat their wings and crawled head downward down a blackened wall and upside down in air were towers uh, tolling reminiscent bells that kept the hours and voices sing out of empty cisterns and exhausted wells it uh, goes on in this decayed hall among the mountains in the faint moonlight the grass is singing over the tumbled graves about the chapel there is the empty chapel only the winds home it has no windows and the door swings Rye bonds can harm no one. Only a cock stood on the roof tree. Cockerico, cockerico, in a flash of lightning. Then a damp guest bringing rain. The first passage refers to the ap apocalyptic uh, painting of Hieronymus Bosch, the Dutch artist. Bosch was way ahead of his time, who painted freely, uh, inventing religious allegories. Uh, predominant, uh, predominantly the nightmarish visions of hellish macabre. The phantasmagoria created by him often jostle with strange forms composed of dislocated elements of real beings. Here, Eliot evokes the hallucinatory visions that the questing knight may have experienced when he enters the chapel, when he approaches the chapel Perilous. In the Old Testament, the empty cisterns and wells signify the loss of faith and the worship of false gods. The bell may be a reference to uh, Robert Browning's poem, uh, Child Roland to the Dark Tower Cave, which offers a sense of a double world, another plane of reality in which the character is in exile. The cock is associated with the betrayal, uh, the episode mentioned in the New Testament, especially Peter's denial of Christ. Peter denies Christ thrice on the morning of his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. It should be assumed that the questing knight has entered into the chapel fitless, but can he find the grave? Please look at this picture. It's the painting by uh, Hieronymus Bosch, uh, apocalyptic vision of hell, is 
portrayed here. Eliot deliberately uh, arises confusion about the chapel since the description may suit to any abandoned chapel of the prevalent day due to lack of faith. In the Grey Legends, the approach to the chapel perilous is the final stage of the Grail quest where the quester may meet with many terrifying adventure in a mysterious chapel before going on to the Grail castle itself. Sometimes he may find dead bodies laid on the altar. Sometimes a black hand may extinguish the candles and also strange and frightening voices may be heard. The, all uh, these, uh, the, the echo of all these elements are incorporated in the above lines. The quester is left in the chapel. Uh, in, in these lines, as we can see, the quester is left in the chapel. The castle does not appear, nor the grave. Thus, the journey, uh, the journey remains inconclus inconclusive. Now, we move on to the next passage. Ganga was sunken, and the limp leaves waited for rain, while the black clouds gathered far distant over Himavan. The jungle crouched, hummed in silence. Then spoke the thunder. Ta, Datta, what have we given, my friend? Blood shaking my heart, the awful daring of a moment's surrender, which an age of prudence can never retract. By this and this only, we have existed, which is not to be found in our obituaries, nor in memories draped by the beneficent spider or under seals broken by the lean solicitor in our empty rooms. Ta, Dayadham. I have heard the key turn in the door once and turn once only. We think of the key, each in his prison, thinking of the key, each confirms a prison. Only at nightfall, ethereal rumors revive for a moment a broken Coriolanus. The bot responded gaily to the hand expert with pale and awe. The sea was calm. Your heart would have responded gaily when invited, beating obedient to controlling hands. It is used to the Sanskrit names like Ganga and Himavant instead of the usual anglicized terms. Here, the fable of the thunder from the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad is referred in which Prajapati, the creator, instructs his threefold offsprings, namely gods, demons, and men. Each of them he utters the same syllable, the. Da, there is a spelling mistake here in the slide. D E A, da. And each group interprets the syllable differently. The gods interpret it as damyata, which means control yourself. The demon interpret it as dayadvam, uh, which means sympathize or, or be compassionate. And the men interpret it as datta, which means give or sacrifice. Each of these interpretation by the offspring indicates their corresponding shortcomings in their characters and the fable concludes by exhorting men to practice all these three injunctions since there are no gods or demons other than men. This is opined by Sri Shankara in his commentary to the section of Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. The text Eliot reverses this sequence into Datta, Dayadum, Dhamyata. The actual text it is in the order Dhamyata, Dayadum, Datta. Here Eliot reverses it and gives to it his own meaning 
As for Datta, Eliot gives the meaning of self surrender. Eliot suggests in the wasteland or in the modern world, giving is degenerated to a sexual surrender by evoking Webster's The White Devil, in which these lines occur They will remarry before the worm hears your winding sheet. Before the spider make a thin curtain for your epitaphs. And by this and this only we have existed is actually a, a, a kind of paradox. It either means only by the sacrifice of great men, great masters like Jesus Christ, we have existed. And in the modern world, it becomes only we exist only by. Uh, surrendering, yielding ourselves to uh, uh, uncontrollable passion. As for Dayadham, Eliot refers to Dante's Inferno, in which the tragic death of Eugodino, a 13th century Italian noble who was imprisoned in a tower with his two sons and two grandsons, were all of them starved to death. Hugo Lino heard the key turn once only when locked up in the tower by the guards and after that the keys were thrown into the river as per the order given by the Archbishop Raggieri. Eliot indicates the terrifying consequences of imprisoning oneself within one's own ego may result in destruction as in the case of uh, Coriolanus. Coriolanus was a Roman general who fought against a group of people called uh, Volscians. But later, uh, uh, you know, he, he was a man of uh, unbearable pride and he was greatly uh, 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 contemptor, uh, uh, greatly rebuked by his own people. So he participates on, uh, he joins the Volscians to fight against uh, his own people, Romans. But upon the uh, constant uh, plea of his mother and his wife, he decides to uh, uh, save the city uh, by signing a favorable treatise. But upon his return to uh, uh, the Volscians, he was uh, publicly slain. So this is the story of Coriolanus and Eliot wants to suggest that uh, in a moment the wastelanders may be seen uh, to be reviving themselves but in the very next moment uh, you know they are going back to their mad pursuit yes uh, they are broken uh, just like uh, Coriolanus. As for Damyata, Eliot suggests that people in the wasteland are just like abandoned bots which float gaily on the seemingly endless ocean of sensual pleasure. Now the poem goes back to the fisher king. I sat upon the shore fishing with the arid plain behind me. Shall I at least set my lands in order? London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. Voices, Nelfoko, Shegali, Afina. Quand of him, beauty children, oh swallow, swallow, la prince de Aquitaine, a la tour bolly. These fragments I have showed against my ruins. Why then? I'll fit you. Hieronimo is mad again. Datta, Dayadam, Damita, Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. The question of the Fisher King Shall I at least set my land in order? remains unanswered and followed by. A nursery rhyme which offers a vision of the falling towers, the collapse of civilization, and the disintegration of the self. It is followed by Dante's vision of Arnold Daniel, who is suffering the punishment of the less full in the refining fires of the purgatory. Then it is followed by an anonymous Latin poem, The Vigil of Venice, which can be translated as When shall I become uh, as the swallow, walking the story of Procne and Philomela? and the unbearable yearning for release and transformation together with an anguished recognition of its impossibility.
Next line can be translated as Prince Aquitaine in the ruined tower, which is taken from the disinherited by Gerard du Nerval. The ruined castle is symptomatic of a decayed tradition. Next, Elliot refers to the Spanish tragedy by Thomas Kidd, in which Hieronimo, uh, who is frantic with grief because of in, in, the, in the slide, it is misspelled as Greece. I'm sorry. Uh, Hieronimo, who is frantic with grief because of the murder of his son, plans the destruction of the murderers by giving them roles in a play he writes composed of fragments of poetry in an unknown language, in unknown la languages where each character kills each other. The poem ends with the Dhananobis Pesam or the Shanti Mantra from the Upanishad. It implies that the speaker had to look beyond the European tradition to find a word of adequate depth and resonance. The ending of Eliot's poem is hedged with uncertainty. The invocation seems to articulate a desire rather than to offer um, an achieved state. Thus, like, an, like the formal ending of an Upanishad, the Upanishad of modern world, that means the poem Wasteland, ends on a note of uncertainty. Thank you. Uh, so, so Hello? Sir, we have a few questions oh. here. Can I? Yeah. Yeah, sure. The first question is, is my Are there any Shakespearean element in the wasteland? Of course, we have seen a lot of uh, episodes taken from the different plays of William Shakespeare. The first section we have The Tempest, uh, in which the, the song of uh, the spirit Ariel is mentioned. Then it uh, uh, resonates through the other sections also uh, then we have uh, a, 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 an episode from antony and cleopatra then uh, we have uh, um, an episode from coriolanus which we just mentioned so many allusions to william shakespeare can be found in the wasteland what is an example of epistemological difficulties and the literary experimentation in the wasteland and the sound and the fury and the sound and the fury means the work of Faulkner I think so yeah okay uh, by the phrase epistemological difficulty I don't know what she uh, means by that anyway epistemology is something which is related to knowledge the branch of knowledge in philosophy Epistemological difficulty can be taken as uh, the, uh, uh, the difficulty to understand the allusions. And uh, the second part of the question, epistemological difficulty and? Literary experimentation in the wasteland. Yeah, of course, of course, there are, there, are, uh, uh, there, uh, there are so many experiments, especially in the form. You know, Eliot uh, incorporates, I've already mentioned that in the first class, Eliot incorporates a cinematographic technique in, in the wasteland and the technique of, uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, incorporating different sounds. And uh, he also experiments a lot in uh, the, the, the uh, meter. Sometimes we can find that he uh, follows the metrical dexterity of the great masters of the past, but sometimes he violates, he deliberately violates or, or he deliberately deviates from it. And all in all, we can see uh, the allusions, the references, uh, the different voices, uh, the incorporation of, incorporation of, uh, of uh, lines from other texts, uh, 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 make it an amalgam of of a specimen of 
lot of experiment. So us in the sound and fury by uh, Faulkner, uh, which is written uh, from uh, different perspectives, different point of view of different characters, namely Benji, Kathy, etc. Uh, it also advocates the stream of consciousness technique. So there are similarities between these two works of modernism, but Wasteland is a poem and uh, uh, Sound and Fury is a novel. And it is quite difficult to incorporate the elements of experiments, uh, especially the experiments which are equal to that of, uh, 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 you know, equal to those experiments practiced by novelists into a poem. That makes Wasteland something different. Okay, sir. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, uh, what reference to, what references to death and rebirth can you find in the section one of the Wasteland? We have already discussed this. Uh, we discussed it elaborately, there are a lot of allusions, especially those are pearls that were his eyes, you know, the, the very title of the section itself is The Burial of the Dead, then uh, the Stetson episode, then uh, uh, the predictions of uh, Madame Sosostris, uh, then um, uh, so many other, other lines are there in the first section which we already discussed in the first class itself okay sir the next question is from Devika Lakshmi uh, can we consider the people in the wasteland as the modern human being yeah of course uh, this is also mentioned uh, in our previous class wasteland is actually a synonym or a symbol of the modern land uh, here we can see Tyrish is the omnipresent, uh, all-enduring consciousness of the wasteland, who is an immortal, who has seen the past and who is witnessing the present right now. Uh, he compares the past with the present and he says that uh, these times, these times, the modern times are quite horrifying. I haven't witnessed anything of this sort in my experience in the past. So, of course, uh, and, and also, modern uh, uh, wasteland was written in the advent of modern uh, 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 which reflect or which echoes uh, uh, shell shock of the First World War and the eventual disintegration of the European civilization. So, in a nutshell, we can say that wasteland represents the modern world okay sir the same person has uh, asked another question uh, can we comment this as an irony upon uh, the modern world and is there any political significance of course there are political significance uh, all these questions are already an uh, answered in the previous sessions uh, there are political uh, uh, significations especially uh, as we can see, uh, uh, you know, uh, Eliot is a bit worried about uh, uh, the emergence of the bourgeois, uh, 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 you know, ideals, which is quite clear in the second section, where the neurotic aristocratic couple is contrasted to uh, the middle class couple. Mm -hmm. Then the politics of uh, the uh, 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 the politics which paved the way for the turbulence in uh, the decade in which the first world war was fought was also there then he himself proclaimed that i'm a royalist in politics a catholic in religion uh, a classicist in literature this particular politics can well be traced in the way <clears throat> Okay, sir. Hello? So almost all the questions have been answered. So can we wind up the session, sir? If if there is any uh, tips or topics that to be shared with the students, you can. Else we'll wind up the session, sir. 
No, uh, I would like to say that uh, I don't know how far I could justify with uh, this uh, this uh, three sessions uh, because wasteland is a, a large poem, a, a poem which offers huge difficulty for the reader, especially for analysis. There are several different analysis and interpretations can be found made by eminent scholars. What I have done here is uh, my own analysis of the poem. So if you go through uh, different texts, you may uh, get different opinions. So try to read uh, uh, interpretation uh, or, or, or uh, uh, commentaries on the poem made by different authors like Manju Jain, uh, Frank Kermode, R.L. Stevens, uh, sorry, um, uh, FR levies, etc., in order to get an overall idea of the poem from a different perspective. That's all. The uh, Diza Maria have been asking some exam oriented questions. Is there any to share with the students? Yeah, of course. Uh, 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 there can be some exam oriented questions, especially uh, I've, I've discussed a few in the last class. Uh, the theme of each section can be a question. Then um, the mythical background of the question, uh, sorry, of the, of, the, of the poem can be another question. Then the use of allusions. And um, then uh, uh, how far Wasteland can be considered to be a modernist poem can be another question. Then Eliot's use of point of view uh, or the shifting point of views in the wasteland can be another question. Then the question of form in the wasteland uh, can be expected. Uh, you know, um, the narrative techniques employed by Eliot in the poem can be another question. Uh, then uh, uh, the way Wasteland as an autobiographical poem and as a social and cultural critic can be another question. Uh, the style of P.S. Eliot uh, incorporated in the Wasteland can be another question. These are the possible questions. Okay, one, one, other one last question is Ezra Pound's role in making this a famous work. It is well evident as the wasteland is dedicated to Ezra Pound with the phrase Il Miglio Fabro, which means to the better craftsman or to the greater craftsman. Eliot himself acknowledged this in his, uh, uh, in the second edition of the wasteland, uh, in which he says that I have given, the, I have submitted the manuscripts uh, manuscript of the wasteland to Ezra Pound, and uh, he made some extensive edition. And uh, uh, initially, I think in the original facsimile, there are uh, about around 800 to 900 lines, and uh, uh, it, it is Ezra Pound who edited it into the person version. He also suggested the title, uh, the epigraph, some um, words like demobbing. Then uh, uh, his uh, his uh, ability to strike off lines and to retain the essence uh, can be well seen in uh, the fourth section. He had, had edited more than eighty to hundred lines uh, of that section into a ten line uh, passage. So, of course, uh, T.S. Eliot is highly indebted to. Uh, let's wrap out. Okay, sir. With Oriental elements, is Eliot trying to prove the superiority of Oriental culture over Occidental? No, not at all. You know, he just wants to say that. Uh, you know, uh, uh, if you are drained out of your spiritual cares, just uh, look at the Orientals. You know, uh, there you can find some sort of solace, but. It's, it's not well uh, 
uh, uh, concluded in the last section. You know, the last section ends with an, an, a lot of uncertainty. Ganga was sunken, you know, that when you uh, go through the line, you can see that, uh, 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 sterile, mentioning of sterile thunder. It doesn't mention that uh, uh, the arrival of rain, uh, the removal of the curves, or, uh, or, or the, the reaching or, or, the, or the finding of the, uh, the holy grail, etc., uh, by relying on the principles of East. So uh, he just wants to uh, incorporate the elements of the Orient and the Occident uh, to uh, suggest that human beings are the same uh, everywhere in the earth. Okay, so we have all uh, answered all the questions uh, till now, sir. I thank you for this wonderful session and thank you also for taking continuous three sessions and making it interactive and interesting. We have got so many positive reviews. Uh, I hope all the students have enjoyed your sessions. And thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you, the coordinators of this this session in SAP. Uh, thank you all. Thank you so much, sir. Have a good day.